Well, hello everyone. There's a lot of wars going on, a lot of chaos. Who's fighting who? And what do we make of it all? Stay with us. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the beginning of the last days. It certainly seems like it. A lot of things are very concerning with what we're seeing happening in the world. So I opened up my dad's Bible today and uh, right before we went on, I was looking into what Jordan Peterson had to say. And he recently wrote an article about uh, your destiny. And he was talking about Jonah, Jonah in the Old Testament. And so I thought, well, what did my dad think about the book of Jonah. So I open it up and my dad thought a lot about the book of Jonah. It's almost like <laughs> every single verse in Jonah was underlined. So chapter one, verse one says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and cry against it. It's like, I don't know if things are any different today. We're crying against our cities. We're upset at what is going on. And, and God told him, cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and he found a ship. And you know what happened? And he paid the fare thereof and went down onto that ship. And eventually he gets thrown overboard uh, and a whale swallows him. So let that be a lesson to you about running from your destiny. Well, so the beloved Jordan Peterson uh, has been sharing on the story of Jonah. And on March 25th, he wrote this. Um, he wants to explain why you should not betray your destiny. What is your destiny? And... He says, you need to recognize your destiny. Now he's speaking my language because I believe that is exactly right about our world. It's why we don't run away from conflict. It's why we don't be quiet when they're trying to silence us. It's why we fight unrighteousness. It's why we stand instead of being cowards. It's your destiny. It, it's what you're called to do. In the Old Testament, now, this is uh, the beloved Jordan Peterson here in Canada. God tells Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh, but instead Jonah runs away. He boards a ship and endures sailing through a storm. The sailors on the boat with Jonah cannot quite discriminate chaos from weather because they have not differentiated the world to that degree. They think perhaps the boat would not be swamped if someone on the boat had not done something wrong. There is logic to that, even though it is not of infinite applicability, he says. If you betray your destiny, you will drown in a storm. It will, of course, happen immediately because what is calling you to be your best is exactly what is pushing you forward to manifest yourself most fully in the world. And I appreciate Jordan Peterson. I was uh, turned on to Jordan Peterson by my son, uh, my oldest son, absolutely loved him and was listening to, you know, all, all of the things that he was talking about. This was many years ago. And I'm like, who's Jordan Peterson? And I just appreciate that he's trying to bring accountability. He's trying to bring courage to the nation. Um, and he uses biblical references in order to do that. So kind of feels like uh, I'm at home when I'm reading and listening to some of his stuff. I don't agree with everything that he talks about, but I, I do agree with a lot of it and most of it, and I appreciate him as a, a righteous Canadian stander, and I wish that we had more of them. So if you've been watching what's going on, if I could uh, read a couple of the headlines here right now. Um, so uh, JT, I'll put it on the share. Canada toughens its stance on Israel by freezing arms export permits. So we've got that happening. Canada's toughening its stance. And then Biden backs Schumer after the senator calls for new elections in Israel. And I'm not certain if you saw this uh, this last few days, but this guy, 
a very uh, you know oh it hasn't sh it, it hasn't uh, changed sorry about that um, <clears throat> this guy right here he should be standing with our greatest ally he should be supporting the fact that these people need to abolish the terrorism that has been hounding them for years and came to a crescendo on October 7th. But instead, the United States is taking a mamsy pamsy and, you know, you've got these riots going on and things like that. Well, we're going to talk about it today. And we have an expert here with us. His name is Kenneth Abramowitz. His critically acclaimed book, The Multi-Front War, Defending America from Political Islam, China, Russia, Pandemics, and Racial Strife, um, was praised by leading security figures. Abramowitz is the founder of Save the West, a widely read national security website, which features, features his podcast. He also serves as chairman of Citizens for National Security, a national security advocacy organization. And in recent times, Abramowitz was delivered, has delivered scores of lectures on topics of national security and threat analysis. And we appreciate you being here today, Mr. Abramowitz, because we are seeing threat levels like we've never seen. We've never been closer to world war, I don't think. And now uh, it looks like cowardice is beginning to emerge from some of our world leaders who should be supporting Israel at this hour. Very good analysis. <laughs> we're, we're in World War III as we speak, and uh, World War III started on October 7th uh, in Israel um, last year. Um, the Israelis don't call it World War III, uh, but I call it World War III because uh, basically everybody's fighting everybody everywhere. And uh, in contrast to World War One and Two, which were fought uh, over there, yes, so to speak, uh, I, World I, War Three is everywhere. Yeah, and I appreciate like you're. I go wow, like are we in World War Three? But I, I yes. think I think you're right, and we just maybe well, haven't caught up in our minds, and but things are escalating. Yes, well. Uh, you could actually say we're in World War III and World War I at the same time. I'll, I'll explain that, uh, what seems to be a contradiction. We're in World War III in the sense that um, Hamas, uh, under orders of Iran, in conjunction with Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Houthis in Yemen, uh, declared war on Israel on October 7th. Now, behind Iran is Russia and China. So, um, and, and as we can see, the United Nations. So that's why I call it World War III. But it's simultaneously, if you want to look at it from a longer perspective, it's World War I. And then the question is, when did World War I begin? And my favorite spot for declaring the beginning of World War I is uh, 3,300 years ago, when in the uh, Bible, the Torah, the Amalekites attacked the uh, Moses and the uh, uh, early Israelites wandering in the desert. And they particularly attacked from the behind and attacked the stragglers, who, uh, in other words, the, the women and children, and got a lot of uh, glee and excitement from attacking the stragglers as opposed to the, the men uh, uh, leading the, the uh, army. And so uh, I say that this is actually World War One. It's been going on for 3,300 years. It's right out of the Bible. And uh, uh, human beings are always in World War One. That's that's the nature, um, unfortunate nature of human beings is we fight wars every generation. We just change the name of the bad guys and we change the name of the good guys. But uh, so that's why I say it, there's elements of World War One and there's elements of World War Three. Uh, together. I appreciate your thoughts on political Islam because I think that that is definitely the threat that that not that many people want to talk about. Um, as we've seen all of these pro-Palestinian, some would say pro-Hamas, and indeed they do support Hamas actually, um, many of them. 
um, as we see this rising, we realize this is a religious war that is carrying on and now coming to our country. Yes, by the way, I, I call demonstrators pro-Hamas anti-Palestinian because ah. uh, Hamas hates the Palestinians uh, and, and doesn't mind killing them and doesn't mind using them as human shields. And so um, Hamas is, um, I call them a, a death cult. And uh, they never were interested in the plight of the citizens under them. They just used the citizens as uh, cannon fodder, uh, so to speak. So, uh, so when someone protests uh, in the street and they say, uh, we're pro-Palestinian, I call them anti-Palestinian, pro-death cult, pro-Hamas death cult. And um, the, the irony is Israel, the Israelis are pro-Palestinian, uh, they don't uh, uh, pro Arab because, like any uh, normal democracy, um, Israel is um, regards uh, all of its citizens and even non-citizens in a favorable light, because uh, democracies are responsible, as we say in our de Declaration of Independence, to protect the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for all of the people. Doesn't the uh, the the uh, founding fathers of America did not distinguish between uh, different peoples? Uh, everyone deserved life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Uh, now we had a little detour with slavery uh, um, for the first uh, seventy years, but we recovered from that and we fixed that uh, glaring error. So um, Israel cares about all of the citizens and its neighbors, uh, but. When you're confronting a death count like Hamas, which is financed by Iran, which itself is the largest death cult in the world, then it leaves you with no choice but to fight because you can't negotiate or argue. Uh, it's like the Amalekites from the, from the Bible. Okay, the Amalekites came to kill. They didn't come to negotiate. And so that's why I, I say it's also World War I. Yes, I, I really understand that. And why do you think that it is so difficult to be on the same side for the Americans and for Canada right now? How can they not be standing for this, uh, this country that is, has been barraged and assaulted for, for actually many generations, but, but really faces an in-your-face threat that was so vile on October 7th we can't just ignore that. And these people are sworn never to stop being this way. How would there be any possibility of a ceasefire? Well, uh, there's almost no chance of a ceasefire uh, as, because Hamas thinks it's winning. I mean, we think they're losing, but they think they're winning. And, and the stunt pulled by the UN makes them further convinced that they're winning. And uh, so the, uh, when the uh, UN uh, uh, passed a resolution saying there should be a ceasefire, but no exchange of hostages, uh, that was a gift to the Hamas death cult and uh, hurt the chances for peace. Because now Hamas will say, well, what, what, what's there to negotiate about? So Israel has no choice but to continue its current plan which is to go into the very south of Gaza, to what's called the, the town of Rafa on the Egyptian Sinai border. And there's four battalions, roughly 4,000 people. Maybe by now there's 8,000 people because this is um, Hamas's last stand. And Israel has no choice but to go in and uh, destroy them. By the way, for the benefit of the Jews, for the benefit of the Muslims who live in Gaza, for the benefit of the Christians, because after the Hamas death cult is finished with the Jews, they're going after the Christians. They're going to kill all the Christians in Europe and then come over to the, uh, North America and South America. So um, the, the, uh, many Christians do not understand that the Jews are fighting to save Christians. Well, they're obviously fighting to save Jews, that, that's the function of Israel, but they're also functioning to save Christians and they're functioning to save Muslims. Um, because um, uh, the Muslims uh, don't want to be part of a death cult and get killed. Uh, 
And so Israel's saving everybody except the terror organizations. So the question you're asking is why would a democracy like Canada or a democracy like America, uh, in effect, support a Islamic death cult over in, uh, an Israeli Jewish democracy? So you want to know the answer? Yes. It's a, it's a complicated answer, but um, I hate to say this, but the government of America is now systemically anti-Semitic. I would call them racist, systemically anti-Semitic. And I hate to say this about Canada, the Canadian government systemically anti-Semitic. And any government that's calling for a ceasefire without simultaneously calling for the release of 100% of the hostages is systemically anti-Semitic. So most of the Christian countries in Europe, and particularly Western Europe, and America, Canada, and, and others, unfortunately, have become systemically anti-Semitic. So I'm working on an article. I write an article every two weeks on my website, savethewest.com. And my next article that I'm going to write this week is, Christian anti-Semitism may lead to the demise of Christianity. Wow. In other words, while the Christians are focused on the Jews in uh, whatever they think the Jews are doing wrong, the Christians are being surrounded by the Muslims, and in particular the Muslim death cult, namely Iran and its death cult, and uh, will end up killing all the Christians. And I don't want all the Christians killed in Canada or America or Europe. And and Jews and Christians are natural allies, not natural enemies. In my mind, Jews and Christians are Siamese twins. And if something bad happens to the Jewish Siamese twin head, so to speak, in this analogy, it's bad for the Christians. And if something happens to the Christian head, it's bad for the Jews. And, and uh, we've been fighting for, unfortunately, fighting for 2,000 years dysfunctionally. And it's now time to join hands, join minds, and, and work together to save both Jews and Christians from the plight of attack by the Iranian death cult. A lot of people talk about a two-state solution. Um, do you think that's what Hamas wanted or wants or Hezbollah or anybody? Do they want a two-state solution? Well, the... Um, Hamas has always declared that it wants to kill all the Jews in Israel. That's why I call them a death cult. I mean, I don't know another name to call them. Now, uh, um, supporting Hamas, besides Iran, was also Qatar, uh, which finances uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the Sunni version of, um, of uh, political Islam or Islamism or jihadism. And... Um, and, and according to the theories of the Muslim Brotherhood, they have a famous line that they would agree to, that Christians, Jews, and Hindus will convert to Islam or we're going to kill them. So there's no negotiating uh, with the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood, financed by Qatar, or the Shiite version, uh, financed by Iran. This is, this is a war to the finish. And, and by the way, and you know who the number one victim of these two, what I call death cults, you could just call them terror organizations or Islamist organizations, the biggest victims are the Muslims. If you go back in the history, Muslims are the biggest, um, the biggest collateral damage of political Islam through the, through the years. And, um, and we can see it in, in Gaza uh, uh, right today. So um, now there's uh, numerous Muslim countries that are also opposed to political Islam. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the Emirates, if they see uh, people from the Muslim Brotherhood, they, they, they go right to jail. They're not kind of, they don't tolerate this. You see, uh, Islam is both a religion and a political movement. And the smarter Muslims are realizing, let's just keep it a religion and not a political movement. But the terrorists use Islam as a political movement, that would be Iran and Qatar, and make it into a, a terror organ, uh, organization, whereas Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Egypt realize it's better to keep it as religion, and let's just 
try to function as normal countries and do what normal countries do and normal families do. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's basically a civil war going on within Islam and, and Israel and Christians are uh, being thrust into this civil war. What I get concerned about, um, Mr. Abramowitz, is that um, so when uh, when the this all happened in Gaza, the Palestinians, of course, are you know there's a lot of uh, you know Israel then retaliates and goes goes after Hamas, but the the Egyptians won't open the door to the Palestinians, the Lebanese won't, Jordan doesn't want them, nobody wants the Palestinians, but. We still have Hezbollah now lobbing these bombs into northern Israel, even though they don't really want to be together. And everybody doesn't like I have a Lebanese friend and he says, oh, no, we don't want the Lebanese. We don't want the Palestinians. They're a problem. But it seems like once you get to be Muslim and you've got that Islamic religion that kind of ties you together, that there seems to be a religious war and a religious reason that they continue to, to band together. Yes, yeah, so, well, let's go uh, back in the history a little bit. Um, Christianity and Judaism used to be both religions and political movements. And uh, but over the years shed the political movement through Reformation uh, and progress. And so we have now we have Christianity as a religion and Judaism as a religion, but no one's trying to impose the religion on somebody else. So we no longer have Catholics who say to Protestants, you have to become Protestants or I'm you have to become Catholics or I'm going to kill you. And you don't have Protestants telling Catholics they have to become Protestants or I'm going to kill you. So we, we've we've learned from the dysfunction of history. Uh, I have an expression, we're all 95% the same. But if we're going to kill each other because we're 5% different, we won't have anybody living in the world. Okay, so it's better to just agree to disagree. It's better for Catholics to say, I'm a Catholic. And if you want to be a Protestant, you could be a Protestant. And I want to be a Catholic and we don't have to kill each other. And the same with Jews and Christians. We don't have to kill each other. We, we just uh, agree to disagree on 5% because we have we have 95% in common. Uh, why, why go crazy over the other five? Well, uh, Islam hasn't gone through that reformation. So many uh, Muslims uh, think that uh, Islam should be a religion, and many people think it should be imposed on other people and therefore should be a political movement. We have to basically fight against the, the political movements of Islam not the religion of Islam, the political movement of Islam, and uh, convince them that they can't impose their religion on someone else. By the way, can you imagine if someone uh, nowadays, if a Catholic said, uh, you, uh, uh, you have to be, uh, to a Protestant, you have to be Catholic, I'm going to kill you, they, they go right to jail, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's same same within Judaism, okay? Yeah. So how come Muslims can go up to somebody and say, you have to be Muslim or I'm going to kill you? That's political Islam. That should be illegal. Islamism or political Islam or jihadism should be illegal. And basically, Israel is stuck fighting political Islam all by itself. In a perfect world, mm. the Christians in Canada, in America, in Western Europe, would say, and by the way, the Muslims in the Middle East would say, thank you so much, Israel, for, for destroying political Islam, which is an enemy of, of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, so that we all can live a better life without killing each other for the 5% that we're different and, and rejoice in the 95% that we're the same. And so yet, one by one, the Christian countries are abandoning Israel. And that's why I, I'm just working on this article uh, uh, Christian anti-Semitism, which is the root of uh, the lack of support for Israel, Christian anti-Semitism may well lead to the demise of Christianity. Wow, I can't, I can't wait to to read that because I think you're you're absolutely right, and I haven't heard it quite phrased that way, but I I think that is exactly what could happen because Israel is on the front line of fighting this grave evil. They're at right. the front line, and if we don't support them, we're next, and so are the queers that's, for that's Palestine. Right. You know, that's right. <laughs> I right. mean, so little uh, Israel 
the 10 million people is protecting Jews, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, everybody you can think of from a death cult. And, and instead of getting praise of, uh, or, or arms or money or, or just clapping and say, thank you so much, thank you so much, uh, Israel gets all the disdain and that's rooted in the disdain is anti-Semitism. And that's what I said, in this anti-Semitism is destroying the ability of Christians to think clearly and understand that Israel's doing them a favor, not a disservice, a favor, by mm -hmm. confronting political Islam head on. Yeah, thank God for them. Um, we, what do we know about the history of political Islam? And some, I, I've had Muslim friends and they said that they would kill me too. That was their comment. And they were afraid of certain factions of the Muslim, uh, you know, religion. So political Islam and radicals, what do we know about where this began? Can we, can we go back to a certain point in history? Did it begin even right with Muhammad? Because he had a pretty difficult past as well. Right. So you go back to roughly the year 630. Uh, uh, when uh, Muhammad uh, passed away, his followers took over, and they basically declared war on the world. So they were based in what we now call Saudi Arabia. And then over the next 100, 200 years, they expanded into roughly 55 other countries, mostly Christian countries, in one Jewish country, and, and basically uh, converted everyone to Islam or killed them or gave them a chance to leave if they wanted to leave. Sometimes they could leave, depending on the country. And uh, now this was 1400 years ago, so no one, no one even remembers it, right? If you walk down the street and say, uh, Mr. Christian pedestrian, do you know that half the Christian world was lost 1400 years ago when Muhammad and his uh, political uh, Islam uh, warriors uh, threw the sword basically uh, uh, pushed every, uh, forced everybody into Islam or killed them in Egypt and Syria and Iraq and, and Turkey came a few hundred years later. They go, I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't bother me with ancient history. So the Christian world lost half of its world. And in my forthcoming article, I'm gonna project that uh, Christianity will lose another half of the world. In other words, there's two billion Christians now, a billion and a half Muslims. And if the Christians don't come to their senses over the next two, three generations, they'll, uh, they'll go from two billion to one billion Christians. Half the half a billion of the Christians will disappear. E e e either because they get killed by the Muslims or they convert to Islam, or they just lose interest in Christianity and they say, oh, you know, my, my grandfather was a Christian and I'm an atheist. So they, they didn't get killed in that example but they just lost their, their love of Christianity, their, their, their faith in the New Testament, certainly their faith in the Old Testament, and they just become secular nothings. And um, they uh, have no, uh, no respect for God. Now, by the way, there's another word for God that you can use, and, and that's conscience. Um, yeah, so sometimes I meet people and I talk about good and evil, and they say, well, I don't believe in God anymore. Can I still be good? So I have a standard expression. Do you have a conscience? Can you determine right from wrong, good from evil? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, then that, that, that's, that, uh, that's, that's okay. That's acceptable. Not everybody has to believe in God. We, we don't force people to do anything in uh, Western civilization. But but uh, half of the Christian countries can become Muslim countries if you don't wake up. And, uh, and, and, and Muslims can go from one and a half billion to two and a half billion, while the Christians go from two billion to one billion. So I, I'd say uh, Christianity is fighting for its life. By the way, Judaism's fighting for its life, but Jews know that because Jews have been fighting for our lives for 3,800 years. So you can't scare a Jew into saying, you know, Judaism's fighting for its life. Of course, every generation we fight for our lives. It's Christians who don't understand that Christians are fighting for their life through Israel right now, and they're failing. A big F. I think you're right. Like we've had so many years of, of you know, being able to worship as we choose. 
all of a sudden, this last few years, I mean, you've got the the rise of wokeism and Marxism and crazy, like even a, a turn to communism, even in our own country of Canada. But I hear from people all over the world and they're concerned. People in Germany are concerned. When we had Christine Anderson on, I mention her a lot because she's very concerned about political Islam. But in order to speak up about this, you're going to, you know, be potentially categorized as an Islamophobe or, you know, that you're a racist or something like that. So people are very fearful to speak up, but I don't think we can afford to be silent. And, you know, I think that we can link arms with those who are of like mind regarding freedom. You don't, you can believe in your consciousness all you want, hope it helps you in eternity, but at least we can still live at peace. We can still live at peace and go, we're not trying to kill one another. This particular movement is about killing people. And the apathy or the ignorance uh, of our of our leaders about this is really shocking. And those same people that, for, for instance, Biden and Trudeau, the Build Back Better, Better Buddies, um, they're both hated by the, um, the pro-Hamas people because there's been lukewarmly supporting Israel. They just can't win. They're playing, ba- playing uh, both sides of the fence here, and they're not winning anybody. Yeah, they're making a big mistake uh, in policy, but they're also making big mistakes as, po- as politicians. I think their, their advisors are very poor. When, when you have a uh, Israel uh, fighting for its life, to, to protect all the values of Western civilization, all the values of democracy, all the values of the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, and they're fighting against a death cult. And you're a politician and say, well, you know, on one hand we have Israel, on the other hand we have this death cult, and, and, and uh, uh, I, I have uh, support Israel and I have support the death cult. Uh, they're, destroying, they're destroying themselves as politicians. You, 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 can you imagine going to a, 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 a Western movie with John Wayne or a Star Wars movie with Luke Skywalker? And I ask you, who's good and who's evil? Is it Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader? And you say, well, I don't know. It's so difficult. You know, Luke Skywalker has so many good things, but he has bad things. And Darth Vader, he has some good things too, and I can't decide. Okay, if you're five years old, you can decide in three seconds. Okay, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to determine good versus evil. So after you become an adult and you're a prime minister or you're a president, if you can't determine the difference between good and evil, between a democracy and a death cult, there's no future for you. You're, you're finished, okay? 100%. And, and by the way, if you look at history, any country that becomes anti-Semitic, that's the end of the country. Right. In, in the 1200s and 1300s and 1400s, the Europeans, Christians, uh, pushed the Jews out. Europe's never recovered. Okay, even though the Jews are a small percentage, because the if, if you can't tolerate 2% of the people or 5% being Jews, there's another 2% of some other people that you can't tolerate. And you get rid of all the minorities and you get rid of all the competition. What makes countries great? It's competition between different groups of people who have different abilities or not abilities, and they, and they, it's like a big Olympics. So, can you imagine having an Olympics and say that uh, this group of people can't run and that people can't run? Like during World War II, Hitler said the Jew, Jews can't run, the blacks can't run in some race. What kind of Olympics is that? And so Canada better come to its senses. America better come to its senses. We, we, we have a, an, an our next election. And if we have to vote for people who understand the difference between good and evil. And politicians who don't understand the difference uh, should all be out, gone, finished. What do you make of Schumer uh, basically calling for another election in Israel as if it's any of his business as they're facing this biggest threat of, of their existence? Uh, what what do you think about this act? Well, uh, his behavior was anti-Semitic, and Jews can be anti-Semitic. I mean, I hate to say that. I know and, he's a uh, Jew. <laughs> it's yeah, so so shocking, right. you know. But he was uh, he was under orders. Uh, my guess is uh, Obama 
told Biden to tell Schumer there to give go. an anti-Semitic speech. Yeah. And, and they didn't want a Christian giving an anti-Semitic speech. So they, they picked the highest ranking Jew. And he's um, a puppet. He's who's, being used then. Yeah. And he's being allowed to being used because he has no morality anymore. He, he can't tell the difference between good and evil. And he calls for regime change in America's number one ally. By the way, not regime change in Iran, <laughs> Russia, China, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, North Korea, but only in our number one ally, we need regime change. This is unconscionable. And that's the end of his career. He doesn't know it, but he's finished. And uh, and it's, it's just an uh, outrage that he would do it and, and an um, outrage that the um, the Biden administration um, took on uh, an anti-Semitic uh, policy. It really is. And when you say it's the end of his career, is that because do you think that because of what he's doing, uh, people will not be able to tolerate this? Because in general, I think people understand that we've got to fight for for Israel. I, I think most people, except for our cowardly government and and I guess the Obama puppets. So, geez, you well, think they're, that'll they're end right. his career? By the way, just just to rephrase your comment, yeah. uh, uh, Israel's fighting for the Jews, for the Christians, for the Muslims, and for the Hindus against. Islamic death cults. Now, that's as close to good and evil as you ever get in life. It's it's right out of a Hollywood script, if they could write a Hollywood script anymore that's worth watching. And so anybody who's on the side of evil has, has no future. Because when the uh, forces of good take over, which they will eventually, hopefully before too long, um, all of these people will be uh, disgraced out of um, political positions. Wow. Um, can you give us a little history lesson on the land? People say that Israel is is an occupier. What do you say to that? <laughs> well, so I have a standard expression that uh, uh, Jews have more rights to be in Israel than uh, Canadians have to be in Canada and Americans have to be in America. So, for example, uh, Canadians have been in Canada roughly 400 years. America have been in, uh, Americans have been in America 400 years. Brits have been in England about 1,000 years. French, Germans, Russians, all about 1,000 years. Jews have been living in Israel, which was then called Judea, uh, for 3,800 years since Abraham. And, uh, and then 500 years later through Moses, and then uh, another 300 years later, uh, roughly 3,000 years ago, with the sovereign state of Israel, which was uh, led by King Saul and then King David and King Solomon. So the Jews have illegally been in Israel for 3,000 years, but as uh, wanderers or uh, journeyers, uh, they, they've been in Israel 3,800 years. And uh, now the, the uh, Muslims, uh, all lived in Saudi Arabia uh, um, uh, roughly 1,400 years ago, and they uh, illegally invaded all the countries that they're in. So um, the occupiers are the Muslims, not the Jews. In the Arabs in particular, what people call Palestinians, I just call Arabs who came from Lebanon or Syria Jordan. or Jordan or Egypt, uh, these Arabs have been living in Israel for roughly 150 years. They came in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as the Jews moved back and there were jobs. Then uh, uh, Arabs from Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt started moving into the area. So the Arabs have been living there about 100, 150 years. The Jews have been living there 3,800 years. So the, the Arabs are the occupiers. But, but Jews being Jews, uh, we don't throw out uh, someone who, because they're, they're Arabs, because uh, we're, we're part of Western civilization. And, and as I just mentioned to you, in our mind and in Christian minds, uh, as I said before, we're 95% the same, 
And we're not going to kill each other for the other 5%, or there'll be no one left in the world. And so the Jews uh, allow and tolerate and, and give rights to Arabs uh, in Israel. It's the, the, uh, the Muslims that are intolerant and don't want to give any rights to Jews, Christians, or Hindus. And, but um, uh, uh, the Muslims can live uh, till the cows come home, as we say in America, uh, in, in uh, Israel, as long as they don't move into terror. As soon as they go, as soon as they decide that they have to start killing Jews, they're going to get killed very fast, very fast. The, the Jews in Israel now are all carrying guns. I used to have a joke 10 years ago that in an American, an American joke, not a funny joke, a sad joke, that in 10 years, everyone's going to be living in a John Wayne movie. Well, everyone in Israel's now in a John Wayne movie. Everyone, they, everyone's carrying a gun. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I know. I've thought, about, like, I've thought about us in Canada needing guns because we don't feel very safe. We, we really feel yeah. like we've lost safety, but, but we're not allowed to have guns. But in the U.S., everyone in Texas, certainly, and Florida, like a lot of people are carrying guns now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be very common in America for everyone to carry a gun. And uh, in Canada, uh, uh, you can't protect yourself. And no. if the government doesn't want to protect you and you can't protect yourself, you, got, you have a problem. And so, we really do. Um, we really have a problem. I'm, I'm so alarmed by this, Mr. Abramo. It's like, because in Canada, if you are broken into, somebody is about to shoot you and you take your hunting rifle and you quickly get it nice. out of the very safe place and the 10 locks you have on it and you load it and you shoot him to, to protect your family, you're probably going to jail. But, uh, and, and look, in, in America, we, we have one advantage over Canada. We, we have 50 states. I think you have about 10 or so. But um, our, our states, um, half of them are run by Republicans and half are run by Democrats. <laughs> so the Republican states are going to be OK because the Republican governors and, and the people with their guns, uh, they're going to protect themselves and the governors uh, will protect the, the people. It's the half of the country that's run by Democrats, which will become, it's already become lawless. And um, it's uh, sad to watch, and, and I don't want to watch it anymore. I, 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 uh, every state run by Democrats, every city run by Democrats is what you just described in Canada, where the, the victims are the heroes and the uh, citizens are, are the criminals. You, you can't play that game. And um, in, in America, if the Democrats continue to protect criminals, uh, every, we, we get in airplanes and we, or cars and, we, and the, the Democrat states, are, the, the people are fleeing, fleeing to, 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 to the uh, Republican states. So we have that extra advantage. We can still be Americans, but if, if our governor or mayor uh, it's not going to protect us. We're just going to get in a car or in an airplane, and, and, and it's a few hours later we'll be in a state run by normal Americans. Well, and I hope once they get to the normal American states that they vote for the reason, the Republican governor, uh, that's making it possible. And you don't bring your politics over because it's not working, you know. Now, one, right. of the things, right. one of the things they say about um, Gaza is that it, it's walled in and hemmed in. And, of course, they never mention that Egypt has an even more substantial wall to keep Gaza out of Egypt. But the wall, as I understand it, is because ever since Israel gave Gaza um, to the Palestinians in 2005, there's been no peace at all. They still lob, they've got Hamas lobbing over you know, all of these, um, you know, the, the bombs and stuff. And they've had to have that big, you know, uh, wall. What do they call that, JT, in the air? Um, it, Israel has a, uh, well, a I think it's, it's like Star Security Wars. Tons. Yeah, but it's, Iron yeah. yeah, the Iron Dome, oh, the, the Iron, Iron Dome. Dome. Yeah. Right, so it stops a lot of this. But they've had to protect Israel from Gaza. And I guess October 7th, showed everybody why they have to have a wall like that. Yeah, and also the lesson learned is that even if you have a wall, you still can't go to sleep. <laughs> you, it's not like having a fence between yourself and your neighbor. 
you know, in Canada or America. Uh, but when you have a, a wall with a death cult, it, uh, if they see you sleeping and they think they can jump over the fence or around the fence or whatever, uh, they're, they're coming after you. So uh, Israel made a tragic mistake, which is on October 7th, remember I said it was the beginning of World War III? But October 6th was also World War III. October 5th was World War III. And every day is World War III, which is why I call it World War I. And Israel forgot that it's in a state of war every single day. And by the way, Canada's in a state of war every day. America's in a state of war every day. And, and we, our leaders um, uh, have to protect us. That's their job. And uh, they're not doing a very good job at it. Uh, Israel was caught and uh, we'll never make that mistake again. Uh, um, but it's an important lesson even for Canada and for America. Uh, Americans don't understand that if Israel's in World War III or World War I, whichever you want to call it, America's in World War III, uh, Canada's in World War III, and we have to act to protect the people. What do we do about misinformation? It's, it's so difficult. Um, I think that I'm one of the foremost leading broadcasters um, speaking out against uh, the injustice against Israel and supporting the correct history and all of that. But I inevitably, I've got to put up with an email from someone that tells me that Israel funded Hamas and, uh, you know, that uh, the, the prime minister is, um, you know, he's a terrorist and all of that, you know. So what what do we do about the misinformation? I guess we just keep telling the truth, but how are people spreading these lies? Well, the forces of evil are much more sophisticated than they were in the olden days, certainly in biblical days. And so, um, but the good, pe good people haven't gotten more sophisticated. So I, I have an expression that uh, evil people are good at being bad. Good people are bad at being good. So we, we have to step, our, uh, step up our game. And so, it, so I'll give you a typical example. When you say to a good person that uh, some slander, you know, you, ro you robbed the bank last week and you killed the bank teller, why did you do that? A, a natural reaction to, uh, of, a, of a good person is, I didn't rob the bank. Uh, I, I wasn't even in that city that day. I don't have a gun. I didn't even kill anybody. I didn't steal any money. And that's defense. As soon as you say that, half the people think you robbed the bank. See? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so what you, you ha have to do is after you say, I didn't rob the bank, didn't kill the bank teller, didn't steal the money, you have to say, and by the way, uh, uh, Mr. Evil Person, how many people did you kill? I have it on video. I saw you behead some one-year-old baby. Oh, that's oh, you must be really proud of yourself. And then you you took another baby, you put him in the oven, and you turned it on for you know four hundred degrees. And I have the pictures on that. And so we have to learn how to attack culturally. I'm, I'm not talking about physically now because we're we're not we're not in the army. We're not policemen or soldiers. We have to attack culturally uh, with words uh, the bad guys and hit them harder and harder and harder and not let us just play defense. I tell people, think of cultural warfare as like a football game. You play offense half the time, defense half the time. You don't play defense 100% of the time, and you don't let the other team play offense 100% of the time. All we have to do is treat life like a football game and play offense and defense, to, depending upon what's relevant, uh, sentence by sentence, word by word, paragraph by paragraph. Absolutely. Do you, um, I'm thinking about you personally uh, being so vocal, having a book that is so profound and everyone should get it, um, but do you have to pay a price personally? Uh, do you, do you, are you ever concerned about ramifications uh, from some of these crazy, violent people? Well, uh, yes, in time, uh, it, it can be a problem. It hasn't been so far. Uh, um, I guess if I were um, a political figure, for example, or an advisor to the president and uh, on television programs, uh, you know, uh, 
and, and, and people had many many people heard me uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, there would be some people who don't like me uh, but um, I, I represent um, people may not look at it this way but I re represent the 90 percent of people who are normal and I have no patience for the 10 percent of the people who are criminals and the criminals are color coded red green and blue there's communist criminals there's green Islamist criminals and there's blue globalist criminals but 90 percent of the people who might I might call red green and blue 90 percent are, are, are misinformed ill-informed they've been taken advantage of by the 10 percent who are criminals so uh, if if I actually could state my case and, and people could hear it uh, 90 percent of the people should theoretically like me and uh, 10 percent of the people uh, wouldn't wouldn't like me it, by definition, because um, I believe in the rule of law, and I believe in the wisdom of the Bible, and I believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 100% of the people. The bad guys hate the rule of law, hate God, hate the Bible, and believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the people. It's just one of those conflicts that can't be reconciled. So uh, I'll always have 10% of the people who don't like me. Um, but I certainly want 90% to like me because I, I try in my own way to, to represent their interests. Wow. I, um, I don't know if you can comment on this. I never, I didn't, uh, you know, ask you about it, but there is this growing, um, I'm reading about the red heifers and the desire of Israel to once again do some sort of a spiritual awakening of, uh, you know, doing sacrifices for their sins. Have you been hearing about the red heifers? Well, the, uh, the there, um, let's go back in the history a little bit. Uh, uh, before Abraham, 3,800 years ago, the world was full of pagans. And pagans sacrificed humans, humans, uh, child sacrifice or, or other people. And then the Jews came in and said, no, you're not going to sacrifice, this was Abraham, we're not going to sacrifice human beings, but we're going to sacrifice animals. Okay, so the animals replaced the human beings for sacrifice. That that was a huge innovation 3,800 years ago. Then about 2,000 years ago, when the second temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, and the Jews were scattered around the world, there was no temple to do animal sacrifices in. So animal sacrifices uh, uh, were like a 1,000 year phenomenon. And then it was replaced with prayer. So now people go to a synagogue or, or, or a church and, and they pray for uh, some issue or, or whatever uh, is bothering them that day. But uh, we, we uh, Jews, Christians, we don't sacrifice animals anymore. It was a period of time when we distinguished ourselves from the pagans and um, that period is over. Now, the irony is, I have a special word for the reds, the greens, and the blues. Remember the communists, the Islamists, and the globalists. Yeah. And my special word is pagans. And I'm working on an article. Uh, I'm always working on 10 articles at the same time, but I publish one every two weeks. So one of my articles coming up is Revenge of the Pagans. Mm. The, the pagans, we, we, the Jews, and then we, the Christians, defeated paganism over the past 3,800 years. And the pagans were so angry and angry and they held, kept their anger uh, uh, bubbling within them and now they can't control themselves anymore. And what's going on now is revenge of the pagans. So uh, again, a reason I go back and say it's World War I because uh, that's what human beings do. Human beings fight generation after generation and we Jews and Christians have to fight the pagans because uh, otherwise the pagans will destroy us. We don't have a choice. Mm. Mr. Uh, Obramowitz, I'll, I'll give you a final word. I, I could just talk to you all day. I really could. Um, I'm glad we're having you on again, and we'd love to have you on in the future as well. But do you see, I don't see this um, stopping anytime soon. Do you feel that we're in for, a, it's got to get a bit worse before it can get better? Because Israel is now very committed to eradicating these people that try to harm them. And that is a very intense work. 
And I do hope that they have support, but even if they do not, um, recently, like this week, uh, the prime minister in Israel uh, said that uh, he wasn't going to be sending a delegation to the U.S. to have some nice chats. They kind of feel like, what are we going to fraternize with you? I, I mean, I'm kind of reading into it, but I'm thinking they're saying, listen, if you're not going to support us, we're in the war of our lives and we need to get it done. And how do you see this all coming out? Well, under the current, uh, <laughs> I'll give you two paths. Uh, um, I'll give you good news and bad news. On the bad news front, if our current weak leaders in America, Canada, Europe, do not support Israel wholeheartedly and do not come out firmly in favor of good versus evil, then evil gets empowered. And um, evil will, look what Ru Russia learned a few days ago, a few, uh, uh, when uh, almost 150 people were killed by evil. So uh, I, I, I don't want October 7th. Uh, October 7th in Israel was enough for mankind. I don't want another October 7th for Russia. Uh, uh, which they just got. I don't want one for Canada. I don't want for America. I, I don't like Pearl Harbors. I don't like 9-11s. And, and the way to avert those tragedies is by preparing for war every single day and, and scaring your enemies so that you don't have to fight a war every day. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just basic human nature. If you prepare for war, you get peace. And if you prepare for peace, you get war. It's hard to explain that in the democracy, uh, but that's the, the, the nature of human beings. So if we go the current route of appeasement of, of evil, then we'll get more evil, more October 7th, more 9-11s. I appreciate that. If we go that. the other path, yeah. which is uh, uh, the Netanyahu path, uh, what would be the Trump path, um, even though Netanyahu and Trump are not perfect, uh, I'm not saying that, but, but they, they exude strength. And bad mm -hmm. guys are afraid of them. And, and if Europe, one by one, uh, uh, brings in uh, real leaders, not uh, appeasement wimps, uh, then uh, together, Western civilization will stare down the forces of evil and put them back in, in their place. And so we're at a crossroads of time. And I'm betting on the forces of good, uh, but I'm dismayed at the uh, extent to which our leaders are not protecting us. I know I said just one more question, but you brought up Russia. This ISIS claimed attack. Um, do you believe that that Russia, like that Putin has also allowed these factions to come into his country and now they're turning on on them inside? <laughs> That's right. It's like befriending a lion, you know, cute little lion. Then the lion's hungry and it eats you. So the. Um, yep. Now, uh, Putin, uh, um, until about um, a year or two ago, I would not call an anti-Semite. He was the um, pro probably the only non-anti-Semite to run Russia in its uh, thousand-year history. But uh, but then, um, in particular, since October seventh, that uh, Putin took his mask off and is now clearly an anti-Semite. And he's working with uh, the Iran death cult. He's working with um, uh, uh, China. Uh, Why would he do that? It, is it is it because uh, did Israel give support to Ukraine? Is that what happened? I don't I don't actually know that part of the puzzle. It's it, it, Jews are very convenient scapegoats. They're, they're, they're Jews. There's only 16 million Jews in a, in a world of uh, eight eight billion. So it's so easy to be anti-Semitic, and, and maybe they think that it, it, it helps them gain power among the uh, uh, rest of the population. But as I said to you, any, any country, any leader who's anti-Semitic, it's the end of the him as a leader, or her as a leader, it's end of that country as a productive, vibrant, um, growing economy, uh, it, it, Russia will be a dead country forever. You know, no GDP growth for 800 years, and uh, which then creates huge, huge amount of dissension. Um, uh, you know, take whatever salary uh, uh, you or your friends or your family get, 
and hold it flat for 800 years, <laughs> you'll be in big trouble. You'll be eaten up by inflation. And so um, the, the forces of evil uh, are now in dramatic display. Russia, China, as I said, the reds, the greens, and the blues. And there's no future for those countries. They're all criminal organizations. And the forces of good have to do what they have to do for the, uh, to the criminals. Otherwise, the forces of good will become criminal organizations. You know, e either we force them to be non-criminals or the criminals will force us, our Western societies, to be criminals. And so that's why we're at a crossroads. And, and I'm, I'm betting on the forces of good. And, uh, but I'm very, um, uh, I have to acknowledge the power of the forces of evil. I'm just too much of an optimist to let the forces of evil win. Well, I'll end by reading out what God told Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's house to the, to the land I will show you, which is eventually leading to the promised land. And he said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And I think that's why those who do not bless Israel are, are struggling. And it will be, yes, it will be a very bad thing for all of them. That's right. Yes. That was Thank a 3,800 year forecast. That was 3,800 <laughs> years ago. Right. That's what I call a forever forecast. I'm in the forecasting <laughs> business. I do not forecast 3,800 years <laughs> in the future. That's, a, that's only for the Lord above. Yes. Yes. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us today and for all of the explanations and for your book. I look forward to reading. Oh, where can people follow you? That's what they're going to want to know to read your upcoming articles. What's the best place? Yeah. So savethewest.com is my website. There's a pop-up menu. You just put your email address in. You'll get my article. It's a public service. You'll get my article every two weeks. And uh, also on the website is, is my book. The multi front war and uh, and it's uh twenty dollars <laughs> like most books are nowadays and i always tell people uh, you can buy it for 20 but it cost me 200 dollars to produce because uh, all the time and effort and sweat that, uh, yeah. that i didn't get paid for <laughs> and but gladly contribute into that book so you can get a 200 dollars book for 20 dollars. <laughs> i like it that's a good sales job <laughs> that's really good all right bless your heart thank you so much we'll see you soon take care okay pleasure to be with you thank you thank you i appreciate him <clears throat> i really do and uh you know any book that's written it's a lot of blood sweat and tears i feel the same about my book which is relentless redemption my story and i'll tell you how to get a copy in just a moment but just to sort of ruminate in this conversation that we've had for the last 40 minutes or so, um, there, there is so much truth packed into this 40 minutes. If you would please share what Mr. Obramowitz is, is telling us, share, share, share this very worthy broadcast right now. There's nothing that Everyone shouldn't know. We talked about Israel. We talked about the Palestinians. We talked about wanting peace. And we talked about wanting to be able to um, have a way to love each other, even in disagreement. But that is not the perspective and view of Hamas. And there is no way to live at peace with that. And therefore, we have the fight of our lives. World War III, we're already there. My website is laurelin.tv, and I just welcome you to go to that website. You can see everything. Um, all of our last interviews are all up there. You can check out our Rumble page where we've got every single um, broadcast goes live there every day. And we need your help and your support, and we appreciate you. You can, uh, you can bet that the local, let's call them Medianites. You know, in the old days, Mr. Abramowitz said we had the Amalekites. Well, the Medianites, <laughs> do you like it? Medianites, sort of. I used to say parasites a lot too. Oh, the, Medianite, the media parasites, the Medianites and the parasites uh, are coming after us these days. And we're not allowed 
uh, to, to hear the truth. You know, they're being paid to just do the talking points of the mainstream, um, you know, governments and Obama and whoever's pulling all the strings of everyone. And so we have to be very, very careful. And I'll tell you, um, there's lies on both sides. So we need to cut through. The word of God is quick and powerful and it cuts through the lies like you would not believe. So if you go to that little box right there, it says donation, and you'd consider becoming a $20 a month or more, if possible, 20 bucks a month, support us monthly, become a new monthly subscriber. We are going to send you this book, my book, it's called Relentless Redemption. And you might think that, um, you know, Laura Lynn's had it all just okay. She looks like she's doing all right right now. Um, but I, I went through a lot. I went through the fire of personal pain. I've been through the fire of other people's assault, other people's perspectives on things, um, other people's uh, sort of, you know, reflections into my life and, and turning things this way and that way. And through it all, I found that the only thing that helped me, whether it was my error or someone else's error, or just life hitting you in the gut the way that life does, through it all, it was only God's power and his relentless redemption that got me through. And I faced some times that were so very, very difficult that I didn't know how I would survive, but I did. And one of the ways was when I understood that the power of Jesus Christ and what he did for me broke the shame. It broke the assault and the accusation of the enemy on my life. When that happened, I became unstoppable. And so <clears throat> if you'll go check out our website and uh, if, if you're able to give a one-time gift, you can do it there. You can even donate anonymously. And I prefer to know your name, but if you donate anonymously, we appreciate you. We can only tell you here. Thank you very much. I also appreciate all of you well-named people who come to our aid time and time and time again. Another way to help us is through um, just going by email and e-transfer, Laura Lynn live at protonmail.com. The other way is through the mail, and that is box 48184. It's the same backwards and forwards, which is super cool, which is why I can remember it so well. Uh, Queensboro, New Westminster, BC, B3M0A7. And you can send us a note. And as always on email, if you'd like to tell me what you appreciate or what you didn't appreciate, <clears throat> some of you like to write me just when you don't appreciate stuff. That's always super fun, super fun. But if you want to tell me that you appreciate something, even better. But I like hearing from you. I like hearing. I had one lady the other day, somebody on my show mentioned, um, mindfulness and you know some yoga stuff and all of that and they didn't like that so they weren't going to support me anymore well just so you know um i don't always know the perspective on everything that people have when they come on i try to choose people that i know are standing for what's right in our world and if they happen to mention a certain thing i'll do my very best to you know to present a godly perspective uh, either in the moment or at the end of the show. And so please don't get all upset because we are a big world with a lot of different opinions. And that's why I've had atheists on the show. That's why I've had Muslims on the show. That's why I have Jews on the show and Christians. And we even had that one guy, uh, JT, I ended up having a fight with him, right? Uh, right on the show. And because we didn't know yeah, was it? No, the, the fellow, he's passed away now. Precious man. Um, we didn't know that he felt a certain way about something. We were having him on about something else. So we get talking at the beginning of the show, and all of a sudden he said something I didn't agree with, and I kind of said, well, no, I, I kind of see it this way. And then, oh, I think it might have been over Trump too. Anyways, he was like, what? What? So the fight was on and we were on live television. There was no, there was nowhere to go. We just had to talk about it. 
So we did our best and I just held my ground and he was pretty angry that I'd have these perspectives because, you know, sometimes there are those that are very intolerant of other people's perspectives. I don't want to be one of those people. I want to be tolerant of your perspective, but I demand that you are tolerant of mine. I really do. And in this country, it seems to me like the other day we played this clip of some of these woke teachers who are now now getting harassed online and they feel like they're they're getting hate online. It's not hate. It's actually people are just telling you to stop talking to their kids about stuff that's none of your business. And we didn't we don't hire you as teachers and have our our schooling institutions for you to indoctrinate our kids with your ideology. No, school should be reading, writing, arithmetic and good history and nothing else, you know? And so there's just a lot of this. So don't get upset when I have people on that, you know, sometimes uh, you don't all see eye to eye with. And you can bet every single guest that I ever, ever have, if we drill deep enough, there's probably something we don't agree on. And, and you don't, maybe you're a solid Christian and I'm a solid Christian, but maybe we don't see certain things or doctrinal issues. And the word of God says to avoid foolish and unlearned um, discussions and arguments, avoid them if we can. Now, there's some things we can't avoid. We can't avoid the fact that what is going on in the world is World War III. I agree with my guest today. And we've got to have our eyes open to what, what is really happening here. And what is the danger that our government is allowing to happen? We also want to recommend to you that in our very volatile uh, economic world, that you put your funds and your anything that you invest in into something solid. We recommend Steve Merrill from Sun City Silver. And we are concerned. Uh, we have many guests on that talk about the economy. And we're just a little bit concerned that when you keep on printing useless money and you're trillions of dollars in debt, and Trudeau just can't help coming up with money to fund, what was it? He's going to investigate or do a study on how climate change is impacting democracy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about helping? How about helping some some of those, you know, in, incredible people who fought for our country, the patriots, the veterans? How about helping them? Because you never seem to have enough money for them. But you've got like we are bleeding our funds. And instead of being caught with money in the bank that is printed on paper, maybe look at things like silver and gold. We just highly recommend something that is tangible, real estate, things that are tangible. That's a good place to put your investment. All right. So I want to leave you with a scripture. And this is from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Since we were talking about Israel today, this is what God said way back 4,000 years ago or more. This was more towards the beginning, I think, Deuteronomy, if it was written by Moses. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. I think that we're losing the art of conversation. I think we're losing the art of teaching. We rely and we we have all of these gizmos and gadgets. Our kids have phones. They've got the television blaring. Uh, the radio's going in the car. You know, when is the time when we impress the statues of God on the hearts of our children? When is that moment in the day? Maybe it's the dinner hour. That's a great time. Don't neglect having dinner together, having a a chat, a time to, to figure out what's going on, bringing up these topics that are important in the world to your children rather than just never talking to the kids about what's going on. 
I think that you can couch your language in such a way as to allow children at their own level to understand that God made men and women, that God did not make a mistake when he made any of your children. He did not make a mistake when he made you. God is not a God of error, but a God of design. He is the master builder. He is the great architect of our lives. Our walls, Isaiah says, our walls are ever before him. He has structured us in such a way as to fulfill a very certain destiny on this planet. I hope that we spend more time gathering with those of like mind and dare I say, gather with those who are not like-minded, but they're tolerable and see if you can just reason together. Is there a way of exchanging information that doesn't lead us to having World War III in our homes, but rather building communication? I think it's important that your kids know what you believe, what you really believe in the first world problems that we're facing today with woke teachers, uh, with the loss of our, of our values, family values. I think it's important to just have those dialogues every day with your kids. Don't let them be learning all of that stuff at school. God said, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing cities, do not forget the Lord your God. Amen. You know, it's not easy to deliver the truth of what our sick world is doing, but for some of us, we feel that we have no choice. Because if we are silent about these abominable things, then we are letting evil go unchecked and we cannot do that. For those of you wonderful people who are writing me and are sharing your encouragement, I am deeply grateful. Thank you for all the letters that you've been sending. Thank you for the donations and the support. I found out that in order to speak the truth, you have to become very, very strong. If you would go to my website at www.lauralyn.tv, you'll find all of the ways that you can contact me. Remember, my friends, all is well. All is well. Thanks for joining me.